Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Facebook and to the virtual launch for Catherine Bush's amazing, brilliant new book, Blaze Island. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Angela Gogia, and I'm the events coordinator for Another Story Bookshop, one of Toronto's oldest independent bookstores with a focus on equity, diversity, and social justice. You can visit us on Roncis Vales. We're doing a takeout window and curbside pickup, delivery, and shipments. Uh, check us out at anotherstory.ca. Before we begin the night and the actual launch, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The sacred land on which we operate has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is a territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Turo Wampum says we are going to live on this land together and respect each other's sovereignty. The Dish with One Spoon is an agreement that recognizes that we live off the same resources. It is hard to eat a collective meal together off a dish with one spoon, hence protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, Indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 Calls to Actions reaffirms that the treaties with Indigenous peoples must be lawfully honoured. We are all treaty people and are responsible for honouring and upholding those agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share the space with all of you. So again, welcome. We are thrilled to host the virtual launch for Catherine Bush's new novel, Blaze Island, published by Goose Lane Editions. First of all, a great big thank you to the good folks at Goose Lane, including Oriana McLaughlin, who helped put this event together, Ellen, Julie, and of course, Suzanne, the publisher of Goose Lane Editions. Blaze Island is now officially in stock. Our store is not yet open for browsing. We're hoping to do that in September sometime. But you can stop by our new takeout window to purchase a book, no advance order necessary. And we are so excited get that Catherine will be stopping by the store tomorrow at noon to personalize copies. So if you'd like to buy a copy and have her sign it for you, the best thing that we can do without a live book launch, please order online at anotherstory.ca. You'll see a web store and uh, we've got, you know, the regular web store with a cart that you can just um, type in Blaze Island and indicate in the notes section who you would like the book signed for. So that's important so we know if Catherine is signing it for you or for a friend. We are open for curbside pickup five days a week, and we are doing local delivery and shipment via Canada Post. And the deadline for those orders are tomorrow at noon, and we'll get them to you by one o'clock. We'll process the orders right away so you can pick them up that afternoon. So a little bit about Blaze Island. Set on a fictionalized Fogo Island off the northeast coast of Newfoundland, Blaze Island reimagines Shakespeare's The Tempest for this present moment. Prospero, the magician, becomes a climate scientist contending with the loss of Arctic ice. Set in the aftermath of a huge hurricane, the novel grapples with the complexities of sheltering in place and coming to terms with a radically changed and swiftly changing world. Narrated in part by the scientist's daughter, Miranda, Blaze Island imagines a range of intergenerational, intergenerational responses to the climate crisis and has been called sublime by Lisa Moore, Riveting and Morally Complex by Cleo McClare and Atmospheric and Dramatic by the Toronto Star. And I concur. I read the book in this galley form a few months ago and was riveted by it. I really loved it. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Catherine Bush and then set up the stage for what you'll see tonight. Catherine Bush is the author of four previous novels, including the best-selling and New York Times notable book, The Rules of Engagement. She has written and spoken internationally about addressing the climate crisis in fiction. She will be in conversation with another Catherine, with a K, Catherine Mockler, who is the editor of the climate anthology, Watch Your Head, coming out this fall from Coach House Books. Catherine's debut collections of short stories will be out from Book Hug in 2022. 
And this will be a very fun virtual launch. It's not your usual talking heads. We're going to have film, we're going to have music, we're going to have a trailer. So it will include a series of collabor collaboratively filmed elements created to celebrate Blaze Island and Fogo Island, the inspiration for the novel's fictional island. So we will begin with a book trailer for Blaze Island created by acclaimed experimental filmmaker, Mike Coolboom, using images from Fogo Island-based photographer, Patty Berry. After that, we'll have a 10 minute conversation between Catherine Bush with a C and Catherine Mockler with a K. We'll return with a screening of the short film, We Are All Islands by Michael Wu. And uh, this is a film in collaboration with Patty Berry and Fogo Island artist, M. Les Keefe. We Are Islands was funded by the Canada Council's Digital Originals Program to support work during the pandemic using digital formats. We'll return for another 10 minute conversation between the Catherines. And then Marie Bryan from the village of Tilting on Fogo Island will sing the traditional song Alone in His Workshop, which she learned from her husband, the late Walter Watt Bryan. It was shot by Patty Berry. And then to round it all off, we'll have a Q&A, a question and audience, and invite questions from you who are watching. So you can write them in the chat column, which is in the Facebook event column. Um, and you'll all see that. I think most of you are used to that. And if you have any concerns or you can't figure that out, you can email any questions to digital at gooselane.com. So again, that's digital at gooselane.com. And we'll write that um, email in the, in the links below as well. So before we have Catherine's coming on, before we have the films, um, I'd like to introduce, I'd like to give a short bio for Mike Hoboom, who received the Governor General's Award for Media Art in 2017. One of Canada's leading experimentalists, he has made more than 100 films, including 18 features, which have won many awards. Patty Berry is a Newfoundland-based photographer with a passion for storytelling, history, and documenting, whose work has a strong emphasis on Fogo Island. And Emlis Keith lives and paints on Fogo Island. She creates environments reflecting isolation and aloneness through depicting the intensity of weather, light, and seasons, and the subtle transformations of the look of the earth. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Catherine Bush, the star of tonight's event. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, so are we going into the book trailer now? <laughs> and then we'll come back for some conversation. OK, looking forward to it. She was in the blast. Wind and rain tore at her. Wind ripped through her jacket, her hair, her skin, her mouth. A monstrous fury. Was this the worst? The edge of the hugest hurricane ever to pound up the coast? She was nothing to it. Wind would carry her away. But there was someone else, a boy, a young man, trying to pull himself up the steps to her house. She had to help. She reached out. There was a tug on her hood, her shoulder, an immense strength wrenching her back as she struggled forward, pulling her into the house while the rain bit her face. Her father. There was ferocity in him, her stern protector. Get inside. He'd thrown on his rain jacket, a rope wrapped round his waist. I'll hold on to the rope, Miranda said, giddy and reeling. They were both in the doorway. Wind and rain swept into the room behind them. No, you won't her father said, tie the rope to the bottom banister. The house would be his counterweight. In the first hurricane ever to brush the island, Hurricane Jose, he'd struggled outside in the middle of the night to close the door of their store shed and been caught, swept off his feet, forced to crawl back to the house, inch his way back. Eleven then, Miranda had slept through all of it. He told her the story the next morning, leaving Miranda with nothing but bolts of panic and remorse. Without knowing it, she'd almost lost him, the only parent she had left. After that, Alan had strung up ropes between their outbuildings whenever high winds and storms were brewing. Now, soaked to the skin, she stumbled back through the kitchen, ordinary and warm, cards and mugs still on the table. Miranda's heart surged into the storm again, to the stranger, breathless, 
She tugged the rope around the banister as tight as she could with a knot her father had taught her. When the rope went taut, it caught the leg of a kitchen chair and toppled it, pitched the table up against the wall. In the mudroom, her father was a silhouette beyond the door, wind pouring into the house, rain like savage stars all around him. Braced against the railing, he lowered himself to reach the stranger. Everything in the room rippled and shook. The empty egg basket took flight. Miranda almost tripped over the rope. Her father hauled the stranger up the steps as the wind screamed. On his hands and knees, the young man was close enough that she could extend a hand to him once more, she and her father working together. The stranger's hand, cold and wet, grasped Miranda's. While her father grabbed his jacket, she pulled him in, battling the wind for him, dragging him over the lintel. He whispered something as he collapsed to the floor. So Catherine, I guess uh, you're going to unmute yourself too. Um, I just wanted to stay on starting. Welcome to everyone. It's so great to see everybody here and um, great to be with you. And I just also want to thank um, um, Julie Scott so for making such guess, a beautiful uh, book and Suzanne Alexander too. for being the publisher of Goose Lane Editions and Bethany Gibson for being such a fabulous editor to work with. Um, it's been just a, a, such a pleasure um, creating this book with you. And also, I just wanted to say that Blaze Island is a novel that was written um, in community and couldn't have been created without a community of people. Um, people of Fogo Island who welcomed me, all the stories they shared with me. Um, much of the novel was written in the countryside of Eastern Ontario on um, Treaty 57 territory, the land of the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat. And I came as a visitor to Fogo Island, where centuries ago the Beotuk had their summer fishing camps on shore. And in writing the novel, I feel like I accepted a, what felt like an invitation to pay attention to this land, and to listen to its landscapes of rock and sea and wind, to all its voices. Okay. So, are we, uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do, would you like to start the interview? <laughs> yes, let's do that. Okay. Sure. Um, so I'm going to start with probably the more obvious question, but it, it's very interesting about um, the connection between Shakespeare's play and um, your seeing um, a version of it in the UK uh, where it was set in the high Arctic. And, and you describe in some of your writing about how that was kind of you couldn't get it out of your mind. Could you talk a little bit about the play's influence on your story, how you decided kind of what to keep and what to not keep and and uh, that connection? Yeah, I mean, the production was um, one of the RSC in 2006 and it starred um, Patrick Stewart as Prospero. And I was so struck also by, by him as this, you know, virile hunter of a Prospero. The characters usually played with Prospero the magician as an old man, a bearded old man in long robes with a teenage daughter. And that really wasn't, you know, what I wanted to create at all. So, so there were these two strong impressions of this Vera Prospero and, um, and also of the high Arctic, a, a landscape that just also felt so imprinting. And I, I wish I could remember exactly when I decided that I wanted to turn Prospero into a climate scientist, you know, and someone who was, <laughs> wanted to control his his world and wanted to to do, try and do something about you know the sort of the oncoming devastation is particularly with the melting of ice in the arctic which is my climate scientist millen wells field he's a, a glaciologist and um, has spent his career um, digging ice cores in the far north 
Um, but somehow it seemed that, you know, in this story of the Tempest set on a remote island opening with a hurricane, that it was possible to, to tell a very contemporary story that also opens with a hurricane. And there's something about the idea of being on an island. I mean, we're all living on islands in a way these days. And, and then I needed to find an island. And, um, and I happened upon Fogo Island, which was you know, remarkable and, and wonderful. And then, you know, the, the book and the world just kept opening up from there. Oh, well, that's great. I love it. And and the, the great thing about it is you can be familiar with the, the play and not familiar with the play. And I don't, I mean, it, it enriches the story if you are, um, but also the story really functions as a narrative on its own. It's not uh, fully dependent, but there's like little clues like Miranda's name and, and just connections between names and, and some of the characters. I thought that was uh, really neat. Um, the, the characters are really interesting and Alan um, Milan in particular because his intentions are good. He's trying to do the right thing. And in fact, I don't think he realized, and actually I didn't really realize until I was kind of well into the novel that, oh, he's maybe not doing the right thing by his daughter by keeping her in such a bubble, withholding information, being so secretive. And, and, and so there's something really, really interesting in how he's so just had, you know, he's just, he believes in what he's doing so much that it's almost like a, a religion to him. And, um, and he's doing it for his love and devotion. And I also thought the dynamic without giving too much away, there's secrets in this novel. So I will be careful not to reveal those secrets, but a really interesting dynamic between them it is, is he's very loving, but he's also extremely controlling of his daughter. And he sort of you uses his love and devotion to kind of um, get compliance from her. And it's not like, like a little bit like a cult leader, but not as sinister. It's all, it is through love. And you can really see that. And, you know, he's mourning the loss, uh, loss of his wife. And so we really understand what he's motivated by. Um, I was also deeply sympathetic to Miranda, or Miranda, uh, but also she frustrated me in terms of her willingness to be kind of complacent in her bubble. And as the novel unfolds, I came to see that she's a bit of a stand-in for the reader and their complicity in their own bubbles if they're um, in a position to have a bubble <laughs> of, um, uh, of safety and security. The ability to be in denial is a sort of uh, privilege. Anyways, that's how I, I read it. Do you have a vision for kind of what you wanted the readers to kind of take away from uh, the, the characters in particular, how, um, uh, is there something that you hope that we would see in ourselves? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that interested me about creating Miranda was that, and, and she's one of the, you know, the protagonist, she and, and Caleb, who's the Caliban character. But what interested me about Miranda was that, I mean, she is in some ways a dutiful daughter. I mean, she has a lot of wildness and freedom in this island life that she lives, but then its borders are really contained. I mean, it is like a bubble, yeah. as, as you say. Um, and, you know, I was really interested in how a climate scientist navigates their, you know, fear and terror and grief and anger in a relationship with their, their child or, or children, in this case, child, and how the, the child responds, you know, to what is hidden, um, what is perhaps not told, and, and all the peculiar intimacies of that relationship. And, and I think, Catherine, you're entirely right when you identify Miranda's deny, habits of denial. I mean, that was very important to me. I mean, there's things that she won't acknowledge to herself. Her father protects her, but, but she herself doesn't want to face certain things. And I really did see her in a way as being like us. I mean, I didn't tell the story from the perspective of, of the scientist, because most of us aren't climate scientists. We're, you know, ordinary people trying to figure out how to navigate the, the climate emergency and find our way through the world, a constantly shifting world. And so we're very much like Miranda in those terms. 
things. And, and that interested me as a perspective to tell the story from and, and also just as an imaginative act, you know, to put myself in the perspective of the younger characters who are coming of age now and, and have to face the climate crisis so acutely. I mean, for my generation, I suppose it was, you know, nuclear annihilation. And I've always felt, even since childhood, super aware of, you know, the endangered status of so much of the natural world. But but to try and imagine my myself, you know, imagining a future at this point um, was really interesting. And yeah, yeah, that was that was a propulsion for me. Yeah, I think it was a really important choice too as well because uh, both um, um, Miranda, I have a friend named Miranda and it's spelled <laughs> the same way. So if I say it wrong, please correct me. Um, Miranda and, um, um, and Caleb, uh, they are both facing the consequences of his uh, kind of noble but sort of misguided secrecy. And so it's kind of interesting to, you know, I feel that, well, I don't want to speak for young people, but I felt this when I was young. And I, I think it's true that there's a betrayal of the older generations who may be well-intentioned but are misguided or are not doing anything and there's that so I think it's really interesting to tell the story from their point of view since they're the ones that are going to have to live with the consequences of this and yeah. just yeah sorry go ahead oh no I mean I was just going to say that that often we hear you know adults being described as acting like children if they're not behaving like yeah. adults but i mean in the instance of the the climate crisis i mean it's the children who are behaving more responsibly if yeah. you look at Greta Thunberg or yeah. the you know Fridays for Future and and the movement so i really was interested to ground the story in in um, Miranda and and Caleb um, another thing that I found really interesting is one of the inciting um, events um, is that, you know, you fictionalized an event occur that occurred in 2009 that's been kind of dubbed Climate Gate, where hackers, it's kind of probably one of the earlier fake news stories where hackers broke into emails of climate scientists and misrepresented the information to make it look like they were lying or that climate change was a hoax. And I actually remember that, and I remember being in the train station and hearing about that, but anyway, and never really heard the follow-up. <laughs> but in the years following those that conversation, uh, in the me oh yeah, I was going to say the media kind of took on a both sides after that point. There was this, oh, and it gave climate deniers a really big platform. And, um, and it seems that in 2018, in October, when the UN um, kind of released that report that we have 12, at that time, had 12 years to um, kind of mitigate the effects of climate change and, and lower, you know, lower the global temperature, that it kind of seemed that both sides argument really kind of dissipated a bit. Um, this is just kind of my hunch or feeling. And it seems like Blaze Island is a novel that kind of um, asks us to think about where we go after denialism. Not that I'm saying denialism is over. I don't think it's over, but it, there's something that's been tampered a bit because I think it's so obvious that where we're at. And um, so as it relates to the novel, what kind of moral and ethical issues, not that I think this novel is didactic in any, any way, but what issues do you think we are going to have to face in the attempts if we ever move past denialism in the attempts to fix the environment, if it's possible, I don't even know that it is, or to cool it down or to adapt, what are some of the moral ethical uh, things that you see that, well, and they can be things that in, in the novel as well that you've brought up. Yeah. I guess I'm fundamentally really interested in how characters respond to, to change. And I, and I really see it at the moment through the lens of the pandemic, you know, and, and how, you know, there's always talk about normal or wanting to go back to normal and or how we find a new normal. And and I think that lure, you know, of, of the past and having things the way it's it's been in a way we can only ever imagine a past based on a present, a future based on the past, um, you know, locks us in in a way to broader you know, more fantastic, necessary possibilities. And, and Miranda as a character is really, you know, she's at the heart of the novel trying to figure out how to grapple with, with change. And I think, you know, that's fundamentally what, 
what we all have to do and what we're all doing at the moment. You know, how, how do we imagine change? How do we live with, how do we live with it? How do we bring it into our lives? How do we, um, you know, manage slow change, you know, in the way that the climate crisis is, it still feels very slow. It's hard, you know, we really are like frogs in the boiling pot of, of water, but, but, you know, then how do we respond when massive change is thrust upon us, which is what happens to Miranda in the course of the novel, where suddenly strangers appear on her doorstep and this young man, Frank is telling her things that completely, you know, burst the bubble of her world. Um, and so, you know, at a human level, it's, you know, how do we, how do we reimagine um, a world for ourselves? Um, and I think we're going to um, okay. break there and, and go to the film and come back okay. for some more talk. Great. Great. Thank you.
Great. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the film. Um, I just wanted to, before um, Catherine asked me another question, I've just been thinking a little more about your last question. And, you know, one of the, well, thinking about change and, you know, what we can do without being more moralistic. And, and I think, I think it's just so important that we consider ourselves as part of a biosphere, you know, and humans are only one part of the story. And I think one of the things the novel is trying to do too is rebalance the human story against the stories of all these other elements, um, non-human life forms, the air, the wind, sort of displace the human um, from the center of the story. And that was certainly very important to me writing it was to think, okay, I still want to tell a human story, but, but I do want to amplify all these other elements. Um, and that, you know, I suppose there's a, I mean, that's a, a storytelling challenge, but there's an ethical side to that to displacing the human because I feel that if anything's going to save us it, it will be something like that you know that we are just able to rebalance our relationship to the the rest of the living world yeah well interestingly I think there is a tick who when it bites you it uh, makes you allergic to meat and so sometimes I think that the, the natural world <laughs> maybe doing some changing for us in some ways, but you, you get bit by this tick and you can't eat meat at all. So it's interesting. Um, I wanted to, I was very curious about um, uh, in your essay for uh, Canadian uh, notes and queries, uh, you talked about how the director of an international program that brought writers and artists to the Arctic uh, sort of discouraged you and said it was in fact dangerous to write about climate engineering. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think Blaze Island necessarily <laughs> advocates for it uh, and in, in rather brings up, you know, the, the problems with it. And, and, and uh, but what, uh, what were your reasons for forging ahead with the subject matter, sort of despite the warning of this is too dangerous, it's, you know, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> that in itself is kind of temptation, yeah. you know, yeah. someone <laughs> says, don't do something, you know, as a writer, what are you going to yeah. do? But you know, try and do it. And I guess, you know, to go back to the Tempest for a moment, I mean, I was thinking about how Prospero wants to control everything in his kingdom. And, and that's not, you know, not just Mill and Wells problem. I mean, he, he wants to control things out of a desperation, because like many climate scientists, I mean, he just thinks things are, you know, going like in the really in a really bad direction. I mean, there are all sorts of other blunter ways that you could say it, um, as he does in the as in the book. Does, and yeah. there's the and there's the example of Jason Box, who's this climate um, scientist, an American climate scientist, who got in a lot of trouble for being so very blunt about how bad things are. Um, but um, but so but and Prospero, yeah. So Prospero wants to control his his island, and that's just a human impulse. I think we still collectively look for the techno fix that's going to get this out of get us out of the problem. Either that, you know, we can't all go to Mars, so we're going to need a techno fix. And and I'll, I mean, honestly, I. I I, I don't think that's going to solve things, but that was that impulse, you know, and it's the impulse of among the other characters, the strangers who arrive on the island, um, the airline, the billionaire airline magnet, not that there was going to be any billionaire airline magnets at this moment, but there was until recently <laughs> and um, and his cohorts and you know for them it's the dream of how to continue as rampant capitalists and and what I was interested in is that you know that's their dream and while they're attracted to as one of themselves says having the their finger on the knob but for for Millen it's much more um, out of this desperate awareness that, you know, temperatures are rising and we could be in such extreme danger. And so I really wanted to explore things from, from both those sides. And then, you know, the Caleb who, you know, is sort of schooled by Millen. Um, Caleb's this youth who lives on the island and, um, you know, grows up with Miranda. And he inadvertently gets, gets pulled in along with these three young scientists whom Millen brings to the island who all come from different places in the globe where, you know, the climate crisis would have a real impact on their landscapes. And, and so, you know, they all have their own reasons for being tempted and thinking, oh, possibly this could be a, a path forward. 
and um, and then you know have to wrestle with that and potentially change their minds. Yeah, great. Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of broader climate fiction and its kind of place in the literary landscape and. Uh, the Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable by um, Amitav Ghosh uh, was written in 19, uh, 19, was written in 2016. And uh, at the time he was very much despairing uh, about, uh, about the state of climate literature that it, it was not kind of, uh, didn't have its central place in the conversation, uh, even though it's, you know, the, one of the central issues uh, globally. Uh, do you feel that's still true four years later um, and, or and kind of where do you, um, you know, what is your thinking around climate literature in a, as a whole and your novel's place in it? I think it's definitely changing. I think there's um, a lot more writers uh, addressing the climate crisis in, in various modes, you know, speculative modes and realistic modes and you know some of the things that I was I was talking about in that essay or the you know the difficulties of addressing the climate crisis um, head on because you know as it becomes more talked about culturally the risk is literary in literary terms it can become a cliche and just overburdened and overspoken about so how do you get around that and also how do you get around the the sheer depressing you know refilling force of it. Um, and so, you know, certainly Blaze Island, I wanted to tell a story that was a that was a tale that mixed the, you know, the the realistic and the fantastic and took, and as in the instance of climate engineering, actual science that has an aura of the fantastic. Um, and so, you know, push it realism in in those ways. And and I am interested in the project of where realism meets climate fiction and, and, and how we address it um, in slanting ways or um, not, not head on. Um, I think really ultimately all fiction will become climate fiction one way or the other, either through the, its absence or just through um, the various ways in which we're all inevitably calling attention to it or finding ourselves bumping against it in in our lives, you know, whether through the pandemic or, you know, the, the forest fires in California. I mean, things are heating up all the time. Um, and I'm just, I'm really interested though in the literary project of how we imagine new stories for ourselves because I also think that stories are a real survival mechanism and that's something that that Amitabh Ghosh has spoken about how we can draw on old stories in which humans weren't as, as central to create new stories um, for this moment for our future that re-navigate what it means to be human at, at this moment. And I think that's something that um, that fiction and literature can do. Yeah. And do you think literature, climate literature, literature in the in the sense will will shift away from kind of the individualism, the kind of interior um, genre that has kind of dominated the literary landscape? Do you think, do you see that there's a shift taking place? And yeah, more of a I, col collective or kind of maybe I think not there's, even known yeah. human. <laughs> I, I think there's all sorts of experiments going on and I know never, never want to say what fiction yeah. is or should yeah. be because, you know, it's always bountiful in all its different, in all its different forms and the novel is endlessly um, reinventing itself. And I do think that there is an interest in moving away from the single story and you know the single dominant story for all sorts of sorts of reasons and you know climate justice um intersects with all sorts of various forms of of social justice and injustice and attempts to to decolonize narrative in in all sorts of ways so um i think and i think that there's interest in yeah telling fiction that in which the the biosphere and different forms of life seep into narrative um, 
and have their own perspectives and points of view. And I just, I think there's all sorts of possibilities. And that's exciting to me to see how writers will respond going forward. Great, well, it looks like we're gonna wrap up um, this section. Thanks. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Alone in his workshop, a young Tyler Dare, with his tools scattered round him, sat down in despair. There's a rich man lives yonder, he mournfully cries, while his wife, kind and patient, drew near him and sighs. Don't sigh for the things that are not yours. Don't tell face what to do. Don't envy those who seem to be much better off than you. For we'll all be judged by what we have done And not by what we own Be satisfied with what you've got Leave well enough alone Alone in his mansion a melon ear sighs His wife with him only For money he cries While I give my children The riches of queens I can tell my darling What mother's love means <coughs> His eyes tell the tale of a lonely despair How quickly he changed with the workmen down there And just as that moment the workman's wife said Come John, kiss the babies, they're going to bed don't sigh for the things that are not yours. Don't tell face what to do. Don't envy those who seem to be much better off than you. For we'll all be judged by what we have done. And not by what we own Be satisfied with what you've got Leave well enough alone Uh, I think I think we're back, and um, uh, we were going to take some uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience, if there are any. And while we're waiting for those, um, I kept. Uh, this is not so much a question and more a statement. But I was uh, when I finished reading the novel, I was like, "What's worse than a climate change denier? A climate change profiteer?" <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, you know, uh, another worry that we have in, in all the various solutions and the people trying to, um, you know, to, to try to take um, and profit off of uh, the disaster, this disaster. Yeah. Um, 
while uh, while we're waiting, just I'm assuming the questions are going to come in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your experience researching the novel. You you mentioned at the beginning that it was really um, an active community, um, and uh, and you were thanking lots of people. So, what tell us a little bit um, uh, what that was like. Well, one of the things when I knew I wanted to do an adaptation of The Tempest was, you know, I, I needed an island. I needed a remote island. And I'm really drawn to Northern Islands. And I sort of stumbled across Fogo Island by chance. And then I decided that I had to go there. And this was before the inn and before it became super famous. And and I, um, I learned of a residency program um, right out of the village of Tilting on the far side of the island and was um, lucky enough to get a residency there and, and discovered this small house called Reardon House on a, on a cove outside the village and just thought, okay, that's where my characters need to live. And there was a lot of experiential research being on the island, um, speaking to people, foraging lore, climate stories, going berry picking myself and doing all the things that Miranda does in the novel. And then a lot, also a lot of, you know, reading research and speaking to climate scientists and speaking to a glaciologist who'd been up on the ice, who told me a story about, you know, a polar bear. He thought it was the wind and, you know, there's this strange scritching noise on his tent at night. And no, it was, it wasn't the wind, it was polar bear claws. Oh. So, you know, um, yeah, so, uh, so all sorts of um, research like that. Um, and, and did you find that people were um, invested, like were, were really interested in giving, you know what I mean? Was it difficult to get people involved? They sounds like they were invested in the project. Well, I, I went back over the course of eight years. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, so there was, and I really felt that the you know the novel needed that duration of, of time. I mean, it's the my characters Millen and Miranda live on the island. Um, they're they're outsiders, but I mean they they still have a life there. Um, so I I mean I, it's nothing I could have done in a two week visit, for instance. Yeah. Um, someone's asked why, if the book is based on uh, Fogo Island, why did you uh, give it a fictional name? Well, I didn't want anyone, you know, to come after me and say, you know, but you got this wrong. Wrong, yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and really, it's not, the novel's impulse is not to recreate an authentic Fogo Island. I mean, I draw very much on Fogo Island. Um, and I, you know, feel like there are voices from the island in the in the book, but it's, I mean, it's based on the Tempest. It's a slightly fantastical tale, yeah. and and you know, strange things happen on the island in the course of my novel. Weird science experiments, things that, to my knowledge, have never happened on yeah. Fogo Island. And so I wanted to be, you know, freed in in that in that way. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. Um, there's another question here. You may have sort of answered it already. The island setting is so central to your story, the landscape, the isolation, the vulnerability. Can you speak to the process you went through as a writer, realizing that the story you wanted to tell had to be set on an island? So that kind of speaks to the Tempest too, because it's set on an island. Was that kind of the direction or was it what came yeah out? i mean i think yeah. that there's the the temp the tempest element certainly I and mean, the tempest is on an yeah. island and so i needed an island but there's something i mean there's something that miranda says at, at a point in the novel that you know the the entire the entire planet is an island i mean we all live on an island and i really think islands you know island thinking is central to our survival um and so you know, we really are all islanders. And in the in the novel, it, it opens with a huge hurricane, which um, means the people on the island are cut off from the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, they can't they can't they can't really get news from the rest of the world. And in a way, I mean that's that's all of us on this little blue planet, you know, our our island. And so the idea of an island just felt so, I don't know, elemental to the story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have another question here. The final sentence of your book, and I don't think it's giving anything away about your story to refer to this, is that change is always clear after it happens. Yeah, what an outstanding last line. 
can you speak to how you feel art can contribute towards making climate change more real for people uh, before the worst of it hits us? I mean, I think what fiction does is allow us to live embodied lives through other characters. And, and in a way, you know, we get so busy in our everyday lives, even during a pandemic that, you know, or we just don't want to face the reality of the climate crisis that is all around us and is genuinely getting worse. And so, you know, fixtures, you know, fiction allows us to enter characters who are living in a more heightened, intimate relationship to the climate crisis. I mean, at least that's what's happening in Blaze Island. And so, but I, I mean, I don't think it's a, it's not a hopeless book. It's full of hope, um, full of the sort of sensuousness of the landscape and invites people into this, this world of, of wind and, um, and yeah, like a, a, a landscape that's alive in all, all sorts of ways. I mean, everything is alive as everything is alive in this world. And so I think, um, you know, that invitation to live empathetically through, through characters um, who are experiencing this is, is important and never more important than, than now. Um, and, you know, the novel also includes some um, bad hurricane jokes and um, <laughs> you like those, there's that too. Um, uh, Robert uh, in the Facebook chat, chat asks, uh, he, he says, this has been so great. Uh, question for Catherine, you, uh, beyond, uh, <laughs> beyond the research elements, particularly to this novel, has your writing process changed as you progress through your career? If so, how? If not, what are the parts of that process that have been most crucial to you all uh, the way along? Those are, those are good questions. Um, I mean, I'm not a fast writer. I produce novels, you know, sort of every five to seven years. And I think when I was younger, I was more impatient with that. And now I think I'm just more accepting of that as, as part of my process. Um, and yeah, just there's a lot of redrafting, um, discovering of story as I, as I go along. Um, one of the things that's changed for me writing this this book was that you know one of the reckless things I did was I I went and bought an old stone schoolhouse in the in the countryside of eastern Ontario as a writing retreat um, which where was where a lot of this book was was written and and I do think for me as as for many at this point in my life having that connection to the natural world is so important to me just as a, as a human but also as a as a writer um, you know, to live in close connection to trees and the wind. Um, it's not that you can't do that in a city, uh, but for me at this point, that, that, um, that felt necessary. So that's a, a change, I suppose. And uh, are, are you a writer that writes, since we're talking about process? Um, oh, actually, there is another Oh, there are other questions. Okay, forget that. <laughs> forget my that. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, let's see. Um, uh, as well as we, okay. Sorry, these are. We could say, oh, what have I borrowed yeah. from Shakespeare that yeah. may go unnoticed oh, yeah. by, by readers? Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, I, um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think it depends on the reader because I don't. I think there's some readers that may, no, you know, notice notice um, nothing. I mean, I I played a bit with Millen's surname Wells. I mean, there's Prosper, Prospero, Wells. I sort of went, you know, along that. Um, Sylvia, Caleb's mother. Um, there's the witch, you know, Sycorax, who's Caliban's mother. Um, I really wanted to bring her back in. I mean, she's off, you know, she doesn't exist on, on, on stage um, in The Tempest. And I really wanted to bring um, the, the character of Sycorax back um, through Sylvia um, on the page. It felt very important to me that there be a mother presence in the novel. Um, so that, you know, that was a, a gesture that, um, that, yeah. I, I did some thinking about and felt important and, to me. Um, another question here, did the novel progress as it expected or did it take an entirely different turn? You did talk about like writing 
several drafts and uh, working through it. Yeah, I mean, it's hard at this point. Um, I mean, I, I always redraft things and discover things as, as, I, as I go along and, um, and having a template of the, the Tempest um, gave certain parameters and challenges because I knew I had to get all the characters together at the end, basically in one room. And it's a lot of people to end up in one small space together. Um, so that was, that was, you know, then they all end up in, in this cabin together. So that was challenging, um, you know, to pull that off and also figure out what, what Caleb's trajectory is. And he has to make some gesture towards the end, something that's you know, violent to some degree, and I had to figure out what that was. But I'll let readers discover what that is themselves. Um, how how much of your another question uh, we have from the chat uh, from Graham is how much of your writing is informed by research and how much by intuition, and uh, how much on the initial impulse behind the idea. Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Um, I find with every novel, you know, I, I get about three quarters of a way, the way through one project and something else seems to percolate. And, and usually my novels do require a certain amount of, of research, book research and experiential research, but there's always this, you know, this impulse to, to story that's, that's there, just some material that seems to, I don't know, come up like a, a a plant, but a really urgent plant that just says, you know, I, I have to, I have to grow, I have to be allowed to develop. And, and so then it's a back and forth between the different kinds of research and figuring out um, what the trajectory of the, of the story is. And do you have like readers who you trust, like giving you feedback? Like how, how does that process work for you? Yeah, I do. Um, you, you know, usually I take it about as far as I can go. And then I have some writer friends who, you yeah. know, dear writer friends that have been, um, you know, incredibly helpful. Um, I have to say that Mike Holbrom, the filmmaker whose work that everyone saw this evening was also really fantastically helpful as a, as a reader of the manuscript. So shout out to Mike. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's a definitely a part of the process too. And then with this novel, I also shout out to my sister, Elizabeth Bush, who is a, um, a climate scientist herself. And, and again, was another sort of part of the inspiration for, for the novel and was a, a very important reader, especially on the scientific ends of things. Yeah. And, and there were some, a few crucial things that I got wrong, even late in the process that she pointed out. And, you know, I, I couldn't have done this without her either. Oh, that's amazing. What a, what a gift, what a gift yeah, yeah. Uh, um, of your sister. Um, let's see, from uh, uh, Deanna, you said uh, we're, we're all living uh, on an island in a, in the way, in a way. Uh, can you elaborate on that? I think at no time are we more islands than now during COVID. You partially just answered this question, but is it our struggles with isolation, uh, um, with separateness, uh, desolation? I think that's one side of being islanded is to feel, you know, isolated on an island. But I mean, the other thing about island community is that islands really um, create communities. Um, you know, you're on an island and you're, you're all on the island together and you have to figure out how to survive together. There's no way, there's no way off. And so I think that's the flip side of thinking about how we're islanded. And I know in the pandemic that, you know, we're all in this together can seem very trite because people are having very, very different experiences of the pandemic. Um, you know, so there's a, you know, a, a, a nuance to the, the way you know, we would think about being islanded, but I do think it's important to hold both sides of it, the, the isolation, but also the, the community that holds us together. And, you know, as on Blaze Island after a storm, and I remember, you know, 
shout out to Dan Murphy, you know, who was another um, one of the people who first brought me to um, tilting through the Tilting Culture and Recreation Society and who read the, the, the novel a few times and offered lots of helpful information, who also pointed out to me how after a huge storm, you know, on an island like Fogo Island, you know, there's a kind of cheerfulness that sets in um, because people are thrown back on their own, own resource to, resources and um, and there's a kind of energy in that. Well, and they're all kind of, and they're working together as well. It's like someone's roof's blown off. You have to yeah. go and help everyone fix it. And there's kind of an, an elation yeah. um, in in the in the sharing of the the, the community work. Yeah. Um, uh, an earlier question, uh, someone asked, um, "Have you been doing much writing during this pandemic?" And if so, how, if at all, have you found that it has affected your work? Uh, can you offer any advice to creatives who are trying to remain productive and positive while working from home? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough time to, to write and I acknowledge it. I mean, I'm in the strange position that I'm, I'm you know, not actually writing much fiction, though I have written a couple of pandemic stories. Um, shout out to the quarantine review that you know very um kindly published one of them and that was actually really fruitful um and helpful for me in the early days just to concentrate on a form that was so super short and the complete opposite of writing a novel you know which takes me years and and i do find myself very drawn to short short fiction also also um, and that seems to be my pandemic forum. I'm also writing essays um, that have to do with writing um, in relationship to the climate crisis um, and yeah, sort of thing, things around that. So that's kept me busy, but it's hard writing right now. And I think everyone you know, has to be kind with, to themselves and with themselves and do what you can. Uh, do you find your students are writing climate works? I think my students are becoming, you know, more and more aware of the climate crisis. Um, again, it's, you know, it's such a huge term and, and, you know, it has such intersectional realities. I mean, my students come from such diverse backgrounds and, you know, a, a climate novel could be, you know, something dystopic or in its own way dealing with life in Toronto now. Um, you know, and, and, and various social justice issues really do in, inter, intersect with climate justice issues. So, you know, sometimes it's just a nuanced presence on the page and, and it's like a, a note or a, a bell ringing. And, and I, think, I think there's definitely more awareness all, all the time, but I would never say to students, you know, you have to write a oh, you yeah. know, climate novel um, yeah. or poem or, or yeah. whatever. Um, but I, but I do think the awareness of, of it is intensifying all the time. Yeah, I, and I've noticed there's been an uptick at myself teaching in the last few years of students being more you know, engaged um, with that as well as social justice issues. Um, uh, um, another question, uh, this one sp uh, speaks to the relationship uh, between the young, yeah, your young narrators, as well as being uh, climate change themed, Blaze Island is also a coming of age story for two young protagonists, Caleb and uh, Miranda, uh, who while similar in many ways, seemed to be searching ultimately for something different. Was it a challenge for you to, <laughs> to remember that period of youth? Not that it was that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> felt in life I added that that was not part of the question um when the world uh, was getting bigger and presenting so many new possible pathways which could be both exhilarating and terrifying I think one of the things about being a, a writer is that you never really you know you're always mining yourself at different periods of your life and and so I never entirely feel that I've lost feeling like a gawky, nervous teenager. Um, and I don't know if that's the writer in me or just who I am as a, as a human, but yeah, there were certainly challenges. I think that I made things in some way easier for myself because neither uh, Caleb nor Miranda are typical 2020 teenagers. Um, Miranda doesn't have a cell phone even. I'm sure she has no idea what Fortnite is. And um, 
And so the fact that they're both outsiders in this way, you know, living in this intense relationship with the natural world, you know, running along rocky paths by the shore. I didn't do that, but I mean, I, I spent, you know, a lot of time outside in the natural world. So in a sense, you know, they may be closer um, to the way I lived my childhood than that of, of many kids today. But there is something about the extremity of emotion and response of, of that age that I suppose I've never wanted to let go of. It just, it feels really essential still to be able to um, connect with that. Um, and I think we have one more question and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, so from uh, Cassandra, congratulations, Catherine. Is there a correlation between The Tempest being a tragic comedy and what a storm brings, uh, i.e. disrupts the present and stirs up the past? And that's from uh, Cassandra. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, um, you know, there's there's comedy and tragedy, I think, in in every story. Um, and I hope there is in Blaze Island too. And and yet that that storm impulse of of the thing that this the storm stirring up of the past um, feels very potent and powerful and, and certainly is one of the 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 waves that that rolls through um, Blaze Island. So um, disruption is both a comedic and a tragic force. Um, and I do think we need a comic impulse to see us ourselves through the days ahead um, as much as a, a tragic one. So yes, um, let's, let's hope for both. Um, Catherine, do you have any final, we're, we're gonna wrap up now. Do you have any final thoughts, anything that you know, uh, me or any of the people asking questions didn't ask that you wanted to say, uh, or is there any final thought you wanna leave us with? Icebergs. Okay. Um, the book is full of icebergs and icebergs are utterly amazing. 10,000 yeah. year old ice um, floating down from the Greenland ice, ice sheets. Um, and, you know, the characters, you know, bits of ice uh, roll onto the shore of the island and the characters like those on Fogo Island find themselves putting them bits of iceberg in drinks and I, I just thought it's such an amazing thing to imagine an iceberg going inside your body and being transformed and made a little bit iceberg so yeah I'll leave people with icebergs. Uh, okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I really encourage everyone to um, uh, purchase a copy of the book. Uh, and uh, if you're if you're here in Toronto, you can um, uh, pick up a signed copy from um, another story bookstore. And um, uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much, everyone, for um, joining us. And uh, thank you, Catherine, for inviting me to be a part of this. It was, uh, it's, I really love this book and I really encourage everyone to go out and buy it and read it. And I just wanna thank you, Catherine, for your wonderful questions and to the audience for your wonderful questions. And, um, and yes, I'll be signing personalized copies tomorrow at noon at Another Story Bookshop. So if you wanna sign copy, um, please let Another Story know. And I would be thrilled um, to sign a book to you. Thanks so much to everyone and to all the artists who were part of um, this evening. Um, it was a pleasure um, to have you as part of this event.